Oh God, it has been a week and we are in need of a word from you. So we pray you send your spirit so that we might hear. Open up our minds and hearts to see and to hear and to receive your great good news that comes even in the midst and in fact right in the midst of the struggles of our lives so that we might be empowered to be part of building your new beloved community. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are in Matthew's Gospel again. We are in chapter 9. The disciples have been called and have begun to follow Jesus. They have watched him do deeds of power. They have watched him talk about good news. And they have watched him feed. And now they're about ready to be sent out for the very first time into unknown territory, even though it is the land of which they are from. And that is the story we read this morning. Let us listen for what the Spirit may be speaking to the church. Chapter 9, 35 through 10, 14. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And then Jesus summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. <laughs> Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for the journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off of your feet as you leave that town. Truly, I tell you, it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. There is a ton of stuff in this passage to unpack. Some of which is central to the message today, and others, if I don't say something about it, well, you might be bothered by it. First of all, Jesus is not saying the Gentiles are not worthy. This is the first time the disciples are getting to go out. They have not gone out before without Jesus, and frankly, they probably need some training wheels, so they're told to go only to the house of Israel, and they're told not to go with anything because in the ancient world, you could rely on the hospitality of others. If people welcome you, which was the custom of all of these cultures, they would welcome you into their home, give you what they had, even if it was not much. And Jesus says, don't go looking for more just because you know the neighbor down the street has a little bit more in their pocket to stay and accept the hospitality. 
And for those who don't offer hospitality, he makes this strange connection to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, you have to go to Ezekiel to understand that. Ezekiel said the sin of Sodom, despite what the church has often said, was lack of hospitality and care for the poor. So it was all about hospitality in this passage. But the truth is, before we dig down into this passage, those were just caveats that I needed to mention in case they wouldn't hang over your head and someone go, you know, you didn't say anything about it. Well, I touched on it. And that's about all I'm going to say, because the truth is, this passage is about following Jesus. About what that looks like and what it means. And the problem is, as people of faith, we're really comfortable with things like proclaiming the good news and salvation and all sorts of stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure we know where the rubber meets the road, and that is why, before we talk about following Jesus, I've got to say some things this morning that I think are central to this passage, because they're central to our lives. You see, before we get to the news of this past week, I know some of you read, saw, that the killer of Philando Castile was acquitted. The man who followed orders. The man who had a license for a gun. The man who does not get to share Father's Day with his children this year. His family was told that somehow the law of the land made that acceptable. Some of you might have heard of the other story. There were two men from the same area in a city in Mississippi who were lynched this week. That didn't make the national news. It's still happening and no one wants to talk about it. But when we do hear about it, I hear of friends who become outraged as if it is the newest outrage. We come here again and again and again and again and again. And it never ceases to amaze me the amazement. How could this happen? Why does this happen? And that outrage is right, but it's also historically ignorant. First, there were 245 years of slavery. And then there was over 100 years of Jim Crow, if you actually think it ended. And then we've got police, prisons and policing that all seem to support the claim that simply black lives do not matter in the United States. So by the time we get to Philando Castile, those, that man, again, who followed instructions, who was a loving father, who had a license to carry a gun, who did anything other, nothing wrong other than being black in front of this police officer. What's going on? And if the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach does not reach those stories, it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not angry and tired and tired of being angry and tired and sick of it. The good news is, is that Jesus knows. I give thanks for being reminded this last two weeks about this powerful work by James Cone. Some of you, I mentioned him in February, for those who have never heard of him before, published a book in 2011 called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. The ways in which he has over and again reminded us that if our faith does not reach into this evil that is part of American society as apple pie, that the gospel has nothing to say. We like to believe that there is some innocence in our American ideals, but the truth is they are not. The truth is we have a deep sickness on our hands, and it is something that none of us can claim we are not part of. The Psalms of Lament speak a powerful word to God. I thought about writing my own lament this morning in that tradition, but I haven't. But here's the part of the problem for us as followers of Jesus. You see, we almost want to speak to Jesus and say, you know, your followers, Lord, have stood by every part of this mess of the history of this it has been the followers of 
Jesus that were at the center of it all. It was part of the Presbyterian tradition. It was part of the weekly events of lynching. Go from church to go and kill in the white communities. But we pretend like we don't know it existed in the white followers of Jesus. They never saw anything incongruent with the slaughter of people and their faith. Either we don't share the same faith, or we have a massive interpretation problem. So, as people who claim to follow Jesus, we have to talk about this. Not just every time it makes the news, but at the heart of our theology and life. So let's see what the text that I read this morning, and if it has anything to say to it. Many Christians, when they come to this text, focus on something that is telling. Interpreters and others want to know what is it about the nature of the authority and power that God, Jesus gives to the disciples. The question becomes about who has the power so we can decide as the church institution how to wield our power. Did you notice that? What does it mean that Jesus gives us power and authority? That might be the wrong question, and it probably says more about us than we like to say. Yes, Jesus gave the disciples power and gives them authority, and we want to focus on that because at the end of the day, we know that if we have the power, we'd use it better. And history says that's fool's thought. Everyone who's ever had power misuses it. But that's empire thinking. Thinking like the empires of the world, the kingdoms of the world, who want to manage and control and believe that they finally have the right answer of the way things ought to be. The problem is we have to go back to understand what Jesus means by power. Too often when we interpret the Bible, we take one section and ignore what the rest of it says. When Jesus was baptized, he was immediately taken out into the desert after receiving the words from God. This is my own beloved son. He was then swept out into the wilderness and had to wrestle with what it meant to have that kind of power. And he refused to use his power in a couple of ways. The first one was to gratify his own needs, turning bread to stone. Stone to bread. <laughs> the others were about the kingdoms of the world. If only Jesus could control all the kingdoms of the world and worship Satan, then everything would go well. We laugh about that, thinking he would never do that. But how many of us think if our people who thought like us were in control of everything, things would be better? They wouldn't. Different. But the kingdom of God will not come just because our elected officials are the ones we like. We have to go back to that temptation. Jesus refuses to do that, turns his life to self-giving. He identifies himself with the most oppressed people in the largest empire of the world. Jesus is Jewish. At the corner of the empire. That's not an accident. Which means that when we start as Christians talking about power and control, we have to go back to this struggle between empire thinking and, frankly, the cross. Do not use power for self or to control the world. And so when Jesus calls the disciples and sends them out with authority, he's not sending them out with an army or riot police. Jesus sends them out and says, go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom, among other things. Right? What is the good news? Is it, well, here's a get out of hell free card. The rest of your life really doesn't frankly matter. Because the teaching of the proclaiming of the kingdom is intimately tied with the, with the healing and the curing and the feeding, what it says is the kingdom is intimately concerned about our lives right now. 
And part of how we know Jesus gets really political in the midst of this, by the way, if you think I'm going too far down that path, he says that he has this compassion, right? This idea that Greek is his guts have been ripped apart because he's looking at people who have been harassed and humiliated. And he's fed up with it. Right there in the text. And he says this, these words, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Now, if we're not careful, we'll miss it. But that was prophetic language. What it was, coming from the Old Testament prophets, was a warning to the kings of the world who forgot that justice is for the poor, the widow, the orphan, those who are oppressed, instead of the 1% and more tax cuts. It was a warning that God's justice will finally be done. That's what Jesus is saying right in the midst of calling the disciples. Is it any wonder that the next line is the laborers of few? Because most of us will go, I'm going to go here next. I want some help. Maybe that's just me. I, I, I don't want to, I'm not pointing to this. So when Jesus says his kingdom is not of the world, or this, this idea of the kingdom of God has come near, we start thinking about it in the kingdoms that we know. Right? The kingdoms we know, somebody's at the top, somebody's at the bottom. It's the natural order of God. God has a kingdom, we have a kingdom. They have to look a lot alike. Except that's not how it works. You see how we begin to make mistakes of interpretation when we enter these texts and forget that the good news is not just, yeah, it's good news. No, it's good news for the poor, release for the captives, release for the prisoners, letting them free. Not on parole, not to have that following around everywhere they go the rest of their life with the tag on and saying, you can't be employed. Good news, feeding and healing and compassion. At the heart of the gospel is where he sends these 12 out, and I'm pretty sure they have no idea what they're walking into, other than the fact that they know that their encounter with Jesus has changed their life. And it enables them to go out and be part of this story, to stand up to the kingdoms of the world, to be able to offer healing, to be present with that person right in front of you, because they have been liberated in mind and heart. So they can participate in the liberation of the world and not be surprised when the kingdoms of the world strike back. The empire will always strike back. For Star Wars fans, you're welcome. The laborers are few, because it's not easy. And Jesus sends these folks out, not as the ones who are carrying all of the power to go and help the poor of the world, because the poor can't help themselves. That's actually a quote from Jay-Z, by the way. And I'm not picking on him, because I hope you saw what he did this last weekend. On the end of the week, he went out and bailed fathers out. Because you, you, you know how the bail system works? I know this is an aside, but I think it's tied in, right? You, you don't have enough money, even if you don't have any charge. You, you stay in jail until that bail gets paid. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I'm still trying to figure that out. How am I supposed to pay that back when I can't go to work? And he was encouraging others to pay those off so that the fathers could be home on Father's Day. Hands up, United did the same thing on Mother's Day. We did talk about that. I wanted to mention that. These are the ways in which we can be about the work of liberation. So Jesus sends out the disciples not as the only one who can help. He kind of hamstrings. They're going to go out without anything. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily our calling here. The thing we have to remember about this calling story is it says he sent the 12 out. Right? And, and maybe that's our calling, but I don't know that we have to go out without an extra set of clothing. I think it's a way of reminding us that when we engage in the work of liberation beyond ourselves, because you can't really do one without the other, when we do that, we can't do it thinking we have all the answers. And that's why he hamstrings them. Doesn't allow them to take an extra bag, doesn't allow them to take money, doesn't allow them to take a staff. But the other thing that he's providing for them is safety on the road. Here's why. Because the roads were unsafe. You never knew who was going to pull you, I mean, uh, attack you in those hills. 
And so without a bag, without a staff, it would look like you were just a guy from the neighborhood. And you'd be left alone. If you didn't have anything to be stolen from you, no one's going to steal it. And so the disciples were sent out with power. And they had to rely on relationships and hospitality. That's not the kingdom of the world. The kingdoms of the world do not rely on hospitality and relationships. They rely solely on the control and manipulation of people, cheap labor, and power. Maybe more than that, but I'll go with that. And did you notice that Jesus gave even Judas that same power? Now, we know what happens at the end of the story. Jesus welcomes everybody to come and participate in this. So the thing we always have to be careful about is when we are walking alongside others, we can't go, hey, man, that person isn't really committed like we're committed. I know that doesn't happen, but I've actually I've seen that a lot, right? When groups start working for, for social justice or for any activity, we have a tendency of kind of deciding, well, that person's not fully committed. Judas got invited and was sent along with the same authority and power as everyone else, not limited power, he wasn't trusted with money, although Jesus did say don't take any money out, so that might have been directed towards Jesus. But he sends all of them out, welcomes them all. It's a reminder to us that we do not have to have our whole house in order and be perfect to be part of God's calling and kingdom. Because the work is needed and the laborers are few. But this is where it gets difficult. Jesus says, shake the dust off your feet. When you run into people who will not offer you hospitality, when you run into people who do not see you as fully children of God, what are you going to do? Shake the dust off your feet. That's not very satisfying. Has anybody ever done that? Like literally, shaking dust off your shoes. The only time I ever had that happen is when I was traveling in Israel, and it was so dusty that my shoes were in fact dusty, and, I, and I, I'm like, oh, I'm going to bang them off and see if this works. It didn't make me feel any better about anything. But that's not, that's not what he's doing. That's actually another tie to the Old Testament. It's a tie that is an indictment of where we go and when we run into the places of resistance and death in the world. We can say that they do not have the last word, but we, we may not see justice as we think it ought to be in the line of biblical justice and love. But we know that all of those things do not have the last word. And because they do not have the last word, we can stand up. Knowing that, as Dr. King said, we may not see the end of the journey, but we know that we will get there. In weeks like this, when there'll be more, and there's been a lot, it's okay to get angry. It's okay to ask, where are you in the midst of this? talking to God. That's actually a faithful response. The struggle, and we're not the first people to ask these things. The struggle in itself is faith. As long as we do not quit. As long as we do not fall into despair. Because no matter what we face on the journeys of life, death, despair, and the powers of the empires of the world do not have the last word. And when we know that, in our body, mind, and spirit. It's going to come in spurts. It's not going to come all the time. But in those moments, you will get glimpses of the kingdom. Did you notice that language? And I think that glimpse is that moment when you go, oh, you may not see me as fully human, but that's all right, because you don't get the last word. You may have those moments where you see, how in the world can someone follow all the rules and still be told by the rules that it was okay to kill them? And go, that's all right. Because God don't like ugly, and that stuff doesn't have the last word. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that it doesn't have its last word here. And if that doesn't happen, I'm still knowing. It's those glimpses, those moments where we have seen the kingdom come near. Notice that Jesus says that the kingdom comes near. Not that the kingdom has come and will come, and once we have it, we'll have the power and we'll take over Rome. No, you'll get glimpses of the kingdom along the way. So we go back in these difficult moments to the call 
and the reminder that we are not the first people to face the empire. We will not be the last, and we are not alone. So look for others who are seeking liberation for themselves and for others. Join hand in hand, struggling together, knowing that that will be part of the dismantling of the empires of the world. That is the good news we get because we live in the shadow of the cross.